the uh, treatment paradigm for patients with advanced stage non-small cell lung cancer without a driver has rapidly evolved and there's multiple studies now that have come out in the last 12 to 24 months that have been exciting yet confusing. Uh, for me, uh, for patients without a driver in which we're talking about the role of immunotherapy, I still think adding pembrolizumab to carboplatin pemetrexid is the standard for patients with a pdl one less than 50%. Uh, for patients greater than 50%, I think we have single agent pembrolizumab for our asymptomatic or less symptomatic patients and the triplet therapy for our more symptomatic patients. There are other options, of course, and Power 150 is another option. Uh, regimen is another option with the quadruplet regimen. Uh, you know, so I still use PDL1 to help tribe treatment decisions. I don't use TMB, and TMB is a marker that was shown to potentially uh, be predictive of benefit to dual checkpoint blockade. This is not something that I feel we currently uh, should be using routinely in our clinical practice. So it all comes down to PDL1 patient performance status, uh, and then uh, based on those things, I will make a treatment decision, usually with carboplatin, pemetrexid, pembrolizumab, or pembrolizumab alone for my advanced non-squamous patients. For my squamous patients, uh, we, we certainly have new data from Keynote 407 uh, looking at carboplatin uh, uh, taxane with pembrolizumab that has also shown a survival advantage. The quadruple regimen of the carboplatin paclitaxel bevacizumab and atezolizumab is now FDA approved in the frontline setting. In the subgroup analysis from Ion Power 150, we saw that patients who had mutations, EGFR mutation and ALK, who had previously been treated with the respective TKI, did extremely well with this regimen. And there's some speculation that it could be due to a synergistic effect between the bevacizumab and the tazolizumab for this population of patients who have oncogenic driver mutations. And it also appeared that patients who had liver metastases did better as well. And so when I'm making my choices in the frontline setting, now that this is FDA approved, I have treated some patients who had prior oncogenic driver mutations with this regimen. And I've also treated a patient who came in de novo with this quadruplet regimen because she had far extensive disease, but still an extensive, a very good performance status. So it is tolerable. You do have to educate the patients about the different toxicities associated with bevacizumab and also autoimmune potential effects from the atezolizumab, but it is certainly another regimen that we can use in our patients with frontline metastatic non-small cell that are non-squamous. Well, I think in the metastatic setting, at least the way things are right now, um, frontline, most people are using uh, pembrolizumab and most people would give uh, you know, treatment frontline. Nivolumab, of course, was around first and approved first, still gets a good deal of use in the second line setting. Um, you know, nivolumab you can use uh, in treatment without having any pd one positivity. Pembrolizumab's label, in large part based on Keynote 10, which I was involved with, requires that it have a, a pd one uh, some pd one staining, meaning it can't be zero, it's got to be greater than 1%. I think right now in the second line setting, if someone hasn't had immunotherapy, you give them immunotherapy. If they have had immunotherapy, then you have to think about things like, um, uh, docetaxel, and I would probably use docetaxel with remesurumab, you know, the, the VEGFR2 inhibitor based on the results of the REBEL trial, because and I think that's, that's probably the best uh, non-immunotherapy uh, uh, refractory standard of care uh, uh, regimen. We're going to have to look for more IO-IO combos and, and other ways of doing this, and that's all ongoing right now uh, in the labs at, at Yale and other places.